The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Robert Blanco, and I'm an associate attorney here in the Santa Monica office of Volstor Rosenthal. This is our uh, part two of our two-part uh, webinar series, specifically devoted to options for investors and entrepreneurs. Uh, so today, I'm going to focus on the immigrant visa or green card options. But if you're interested in non-immigrant or temporary visa options that we discussed on our webinar last week, please listen to our part one of our webinar, which you can find on our website. So let's go ahead and jump in. We're going to start today with uh, the EB-1. So employment-based green cards come in five different preference categories. So we'll start with the first preference category, or EB-1. Now within EB-1, there are three types, um, what you see on the screen. Um, and we're going to focus on, on two of those today. Uh, we're going to focus on Aliens of Extraordinary Ability, which is EB-1A, or sometimes EB-1-1, and Multinational Executive Managers, uh, which is EB-1-3 or EB-1-C. So the the EB-1C is very similar to the L-1A non-immigrant visa, and the EB-1A is pretty similar to the uh, O-1 visa. So just to, if you are remembering what we talked about last time, um, they're similar, but there are differences between them. So for EB-1A, we have to show that the foreign national is someone of extraordinary ability. So at the very top of their field. Um, the way we do that is we show that they either have a one-time major achievement, so we're talking Nobel Prize, Academy Award, Grammy Award, something, you know, the very, very top of their field, or for most people that they meet at least three out of ten criteria showing that you know, based on these criteria, they're still at that level. Now, the nice thing about EB1A is that self-sponsorship is allowed. So we don't need an employer, but you do have to show that you're coming to the U.S. to continue to work in the field of extraordinary ability. So it gives us a little more flexibility not having to have that job offer, uh, but we still need to show that you're coming to continue in that area and that you're not just coming to the U.S. to retire. Um, We'll go into the criteria in a minute in the next couple of slides. Um, you know, I mentioned that this is very similar to the O-1 visa, but the EB-1 is a little higher standard. So just because an O-1 visa was issued doesn't necessarily mean that the EB-1 is a lock. Um, there's a slightly different criteria, slightly different analysis, and they definitely are, are, are a little harder on this one. They want to see that the person is really at the very top of their field for the EB-1, more so than even for the O-1. So the first step is to go through the different criteria and to see if we have at least three of the ten possible criteria. Now, not all of these are going to apply to investors and entrepreneurs. Some of these are specifically for the scientific community and researchers, uh, which we saw on the screen as one of the options for EB-1. Um, but we still have enough to make this a viable option for, uh, for EB-1 for investors and entrepreneurs. So the first one is lesser in nationally or nationally recognized awards or prizes. Uh, so if we don't have a Nobel Prize or something, we can still show maybe they've won um, you know, a top award in their field um, at a national level. Maybe they've been recognized uh, by different you know, industry groups or chambers of commerce. Or We're, we're still looking for, for national and international recognition, though. You know, the, the local chamber of commerce having given an award is, is not really what we're looking for for that one. Second is, is membership in associations uh, that require standing achievement. Again, this is not just a, a membership where you pay your dues and you're automatically a member. The, we're looking for associations where to be a member you have to demonstrate that you are someone of extraordinary ability just to join. Um, published material, that's a, a, a a good one to use, but it's important to make sure that the publications are about the individual 
not necessarily about the company. Sometimes we'll get clients who say, oh yeah, you know, the, the company I work for is in the, in the press all the time. But we want to see that the individual is, is the subject of the publication for his or her work for that company. You know, maybe, you know, the article is about the CEO who just totally turned a company around and is getting credit for that. That's much more uh, important for these for this criterion than just how good the company is. Um, you know, participation as a as a judge. Um, you know, if there are like international business competitions or something, and the and the person has been asked to judge the work of others, that is something we can use as well. Um, to round out the ten criteria. Um, authorship of scholarly articles, so if, if you've written an article in a, in a trade publication, something that's been published, sometimes we can use those. Um, display of the artist, of, of the applicant's work in artistic exhibition showcases, not really um, so much for the investors and entrepreneurs, but you know, if we're creative, sometimes that can, that we can use that. Um, number eight and number nine are where we see probably the most relevant criteria on this page for investors and entrepreneurs. Um, performance in a leading or critical role. You know, we can use that CEO position for a major company. We can use, you know, the head of an industry organization. Um, we're really looking for leadership roles here and roles in which we can show that they've had, had some success and really demonstrated some, some leadership. Um, number nine is is a high salary. The key here is is that it's a high salary relative to others in the field. So we want to have that comparison. It's not necessarily enough to just show the person's tax return and say, oh, he makes a high salary. We have to take it one step further and make sure that it really is a high salary given that particular field. And so we can use either you know different labor surveys or things like that. Now, after we've gone through and we've made sure that we have at least three of the 10 criteria, and of course, we want to try to hit as many of those as possible. We don't want to just hit three and stop at three. If we can argue that there's five or six or seven or however many we can, that gives us a better chance that even if immigration disagrees with us on one or two, we still at least have three to fall back on. So once we, we're, we're pretty confident that we've met three criteria, we get into what's called the second step or the, the final merits determination. Now, the final merits determination basically is where the immigration officer is going to just look at the, whole, at, at the case as a whole. It's not enough to just say, okay, I facially meet three criteria. We have to just to still look at everything as a whole and say, yes, taken everything about this person, he or she is still someone of extraordinary ability. So this is this gets subjective. It's 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 subjective um, on the officer. Some off, two officers can look at the same case and come out differently sometimes. But it's in, incumbent on the applicant to put as much documentation and evidence forward as possible, so that we give ourselves the best chance of success. So you know this is the EB one is is really you know a, a it, it's not for everyone. It's it's only for those people who can really demonstrate they're at the very top of their field. But it's a really good option for those that do qualify. Um, one of the other benefits of this is that we can file an EB1A petition with premium processing, which means that for an extra government filing fee, we get an answer in 15 days. So we'll know pretty quickly whether someone is qualified for an EB-1 or not, and if they if we get an approval in 15 days, the applicant can get their green card pretty quickly thereafter. So it's, it's a good option for those that qualify. So next, we're going to talk about EB-1C, which is for our multinational executives and managers. Um, like I said before, this is sort of the green card equivalent of the L-1 visa. But like the EB-101 comparison, the EB-1C is still a higher standard than the L-1A. So we want to show that the foreign national is truly working in a managerial or an ex executive capacity, 
that he or she has sufficient authority and responsibilities for the organization, that they oversee a large number of employees or divisions, um, that they, they manage a large budget, and so on. So we want to really document all of the things that support this person's managerial or executive role for the company and why they're so critical to the organization. Um, again, we have to show that there's a qualifying corporate relationship between the company abroad and the company in the United States. That's where our multinational comes in. And we have to show that the foreign national has been employed abroad for at least one year in the last three years by the foreign uh, affiliate or foreign subsidiary uh, company. Um, now, unlike the EB1A, the employer is the sponsor, is the petitioner for this case. Um, and there's also no premium processing for this option. So it'll take a few months for us to get a, a, for, a, for this case to be adjudicated. But again, it's still a pretty good option for those who meet this criteria, uh, for the investor who has a successful business abroad and you know, maybe that has already started to expand in the U.S. Um, you know, this may be an option, or it may be an option down the road for the person who has started, who has you know, invested in the U.S. on an L1, moved some of their, their foreign business interests to the U.S., built up the company, and maybe a couple of years later is now in a position where he or she can apply for an EB1C because their U.S. business interests have, have really grown and substantiated themselves. So with that, I'm going to move on to our, our third main topic, which is the fifth based uh, preference category, uh, which is EB5. So this is the preference category that's specifically created for investors and entrepreneurs. And it's as much as a job creation program as it is an investment program. So we have to show, in order for an investor to receive a green card, we have to show that they have invested at least 500000 or a million dollars, depending on the geographic area that the investment is in. We'll go into that in, in a little more detail in a minute. And that the investment has led to the creation of 10 full-time jobs for U.S. workers. So these are, are full-time, 35-hour-a-week jobs, and they are not jobs for non-immigrant visa holders or for family members of the investor. These are for green card holders and U.S. citizens. Those are the only people who qualify for that job creation. And the, the EB-5, unlike the EB-1, has kind of two steps to it. So the, the green card that you're first issued is conditional. It's conditional for two years. At the end of that two-year period, we have to show that the investment is still maintained in the business and that the jobs were, in fact, created within that two-year time. If we can show those, those two elements, then we have to file another application to remove the conditions at the end of that two-year period. Then the investor will get his or her full 10-year green card um, that is, I guess, the, the permanent green card. So what are the requirements for an EB-5? Well, we have to file an I-526 petition. So the I-526 petition, we have to show that the investment is made in a new commercial enterprise. Um, we have to show that they've invested either 500000 or a million dollars, and it has to be from a lawful source. So we have to go in and show that whatever money is being invested, we have to, it came from, from lawful means. So it didn't come from, from drugs or from terrorism or for any illegal source. Um, the investment has to be at risk. So there has to be a risk of loss and a risk of gain. We, we can't have any guaranteed repayments. It can't be a loan to the company. Um, it has to be an at-risk investment. And as I said, we have to show 10 full-time jobs. And the investor has to have some sort of management role in the enterprise. So they have to be coming to direct the operations of the business, at least in some capacity. Um, and we can go through a little bit of that when we talk about regional center and, and direct investments. But the idea is that they're, it's, it's not a passive investment. They are coming to actually have some sort of, of role in the company. Okay, so I've danced around this million dollars or $500,000 investment. Now, 
how we determine whether the minimum investment amount is a million or half a million depends on where the business is located, where the investment is being made. Now, if it's in what we call a targeted employment area, then it will qualify for the 500,000. If it's not in a targeted employment area, then you, the minimum is a million. Now, a, a targeted employment area, or a TEA, you'll hear it called, is uh, either a rural area of less than 20,000 people, or it's an area where the unemployment is at least 150% of the national average. So the way we show this is usually from um, the state agency uh, who can confirm that whatever our area is meets that one of those criteria. And usually USCIS gives deference to the states in determining this. Um, and each state is a little different, so you have to check with whatever state to make sure that uh, you understand what they're looking for and what their procedures are. But usually there's a, some agency involved that will issue a letter confirming that wherever the, the investment is being made uh, qualifies as a TEA. But we have to make sure we have that and we can show USCIS that it qualifies to make sure that we at least meet this first threshold that the minimum investment amount is correct. So I, I want to talk a little bit about a few things to, talk, to think about before even jumping into an EB-5 case. Um, the first thing I usually ask a client is, is what visa do you have, when does it expire, and what are your travel plans for the next year and a half to two years? Average processing times right now are over 16 months just for the I-526 petition to be adjudicated. Once we get an approval, it takes another about six months for either an adjustment of status if the foreign national is here in the U.S. or for an immigrant visa to be issued abroad if they're in, not in the U.S. So it's about you know a year and a half to two years until the person actually gets their green card. And having an I-526 filed does not give any type of immigration benefit. So just be, while we're waiting for the I-526 to be approved, the foreign national doesn't have any other permission to be in the United States, to work in the United States, to work for the business that they've invested in, to come manage the investment that they've just made, um, unless they have another non-immigrant visa that allows them to be here in the US. So it's something to consider ahead of time. Um, the other thing to consider is that once you file a 526 petition, you're demonstrating immigrant intent. So it can be difficult to then later apply for certain non-immigrant visas, particularly a student visa or a, or a visitor visa. Um, if you don't have a visitor visa ahead of time, it's probably good to, or if it's going to expire soon, it's probably good to apply for that first. It's very difficult to show that you have non-immigrant intent um, after you've already filed a 526 petition. Um, and even then, it's important to know that even if, even entering in the U.S. is usually okay, but it can still pose issues because CBP at the border can see that you have a 526 filed and that you have a green card application pending. So when entering on a non-immigrant visa, it's important to know that that can cause issues with entry if you can't demonstrate that you truly have, have the intent to come in for a short period of time and then to leave and to not to, not to stay uh, in violation of the immigration laws. Um, now, of course, if you're coming in on H-1B or an L-1, you have no problems because that's a dual intent visa. Um, the other thing I, I always like to tell clients, too, is to make sure that they've done adequate tax planning ahead of time. For high net worth investors, obtaining a green card can have serious tax consequences that really need to be thought out in advance. So it's good for them to make sure that they can have all of their, their ducks in a row before they kind of embark on this journey. Um, derivatives, um, when you have an I-526 petition, the spouse and children under 21 also get a green card as, as well as the principal applicant. Um, but the children have to be under 21 at the time the green card is issued. So if it, this can cause some issues, um, mostly for Chinese applicants. And I won't go into too many of the details on this, but we're seeing that with the lengthy wait times for, for Chinese applicants, 
Um, Chinese applicants have uh, about a two or three year wait time to actually get a green card, a green card or an immigrant visa after their I-526 is approved because the, there's a visa backlog because there's been so many applicants from China who have filed applications. Um, what this is causing is that some of the children, while they're waiting for their immigrant visa to be issued, are aging out. And so sometimes we can protect them under the Child Status Protection Act, but sometimes they, it, it's not enough and the child has too long of a wait and they age out and they don't get their green card. So this is, again, something to think about ahead of time. How old are the child derivatives? Is the child over 21 or are they close to turning 21? Do they, does the child need his or her own petition or are they safe to come in under the, the parent's application? Okay. Um, now, what, what EB-5 comes in, in two varieties. So we have a regional center app petitions and we have individual or sometimes called direct or standalone petitions. So the, the individual or direct EB-5 is sort of the, the classic simple scenario where we have an entrepreneur who invests $500,000 to open a business and he or she puts 10 employees on their payroll and you know, we, we have our investment, we have our job creation and that's the basis for, for the green card application. But there are, are, are a few reasons why Number one, not very many applicants go through the direct EB-5 model. Um, one of which is is payroll cost. I mean, payroll cost for 10 employees for two years can be pretty high depending on the nature of the business and, and what employees we have. So sometimes it requires a larger investment than just half a million dollars. Um, like I said before, filing the I-526 position doesn't provide any immigration benefits. So Someone who's invested, an entrepreneur who's invested in the U.S. and doesn't necessarily have a non-immigrant visa to allow them to be here to manage their investment is kind of stuck. They need somebody here to run the business and get it going while they wait a year and a half to two years until they get the green card and they can come in and, and really actively manage the business. Um, otherwise, they need a visa to come here to allow them to do so. Now, if you have an E2 visa that allows you to come in and, and has, you know, based on an investment and work for the business, you can kind of wait out that time on the in E2 status while you're building up the company. But for most people, they don't have that or they don't come from a treaty country that has the E2 visa available. And so that kind of creates an issue for them. How do they manage this business if they're not here to do so? Um, the other issue that we see frequently is, is people who want to buy an existing business. So number one, we have to show a nexus between the investment and the job creation. So sometimes that can be hard to do, to show that purchasing someone else's business is leading to the creation of, of 10 additional jobs. But we also have to show that, we're, that the investment will expand the business. So if there's already 10 or 20 employees on payroll, we still have to increase the payroll by 10 jobs. So that can be difficult to do just by purchasing a business. We have to show that we are expanding the business in a way that will justify the, the creation of 10 new jobs to put on payroll. So those are some of the issues that come up with direct EB-5. But for the entrepreneur who really wants to you know, be on the ground and manage their own investment, this is a really good way to do that. Um, the other much more common and prevalent way that people apply through the EB-5 programs through a regional center. Now, a regional center is sort of a pre-approved entity um, to use to sponsor large EB-5 projects. Um, I say there's currently over 450 right, regional centers. That's probably too low. There's much more than that now. Um, but the, the regional centers, what they do is, is they kind of facilitate this EB-5 investment. So they collect funds from a number of investors who then pool their investments and the investments are used usually for, for large uh, projects, usually real estate development projects. Um, this is sort of, this is a, a more passive investment. Now the investor still has to, to meet that burden of showing that they're involved. Usually they can do so by being 
um, you know, a limited partner or a member of an LLC to show that they have some sort of, of uh, control that way. But it's a much more passive investment. They're not managing the day-to-day -day operations of this business. Um, you know, the, the developer is. Um, and and the, the, mo the most obvious advantage for a regional center petition is that we don't have to have 10 full-time W-2 employees on our payroll per investor. We can count indirect employment um, for a regional center project, which means that we have an economist who uh, does an economic study of the, of the project and says based on the economic activity of this project, we can therefore create or predict that we will have this much job creation as a result. And so we can use these kind of economic multipliers to calculate job creation rather than actual you know, 10 full-time employees on the payroll, which makes it a little easier for, for big projects that are raising large amounts of capital. So to, to file a, a 526 petition, we have to show that the investor's source of funds is clean, like I mentioned before. So uh, that's either the $500,000 or a million dollars. Um, we have to show that it's been irrevocably committed to the EB-5 enterprise. We have to show that the, the investment has been made or is actively in the process of being made. Um, we can't just, you know, have an IOU. Um, we have to show that the funds came from a specific lawful source. We really have to identify what that source is to show where it's, that it's clean. And then we have to trace it. So we have to show that the funds are basically have been traced from the time they were earned to the time that they're invested in the U.S. to make sure that, that the source we've identified truly is the source. So, you know, this is uh, sometimes gets us in trouble. Sometimes a, a client will say, oh, no worries, I, you know, I, I sold the property three years ago, it's no problem. And I say, well, where's that money now? Do we have it? Did you spend it? You know, if they've spent it on something else, then it's not necessarily the, the source of the investment anymore. We need to trace it through that time period. Um, and of course, with most things in immigration, everything needs to be translated if it's not already in English. Now, when, when putting source of funds documents together, uh, we really have to try to find the best evidence available. Now, sometimes that's easier said than done. But, you know, whenever we have the opportunity to have a bank statement or tax return, that's really concrete, objective evidence because it comes from a third party. It's, it's easily identifiable, as opposed to an employment letter from someone who says, oh, yes, I can confirm that, you know, Joe Investor earned this much money in this year. You know, a bank statement or, or a pay stub is much stronger evidence of that. Um, now, of course, sometimes just documents aren't available. Sometimes, um, you know, the, the documents are too old. Sometimes the investor's country of origin don't, doesn't issue those types of documents. In that case, we just ha we have to explain why those documents are not available and come up with an alternative to corroborate the investor source of funds uh, explanation. Um, you know, we, we can do that through, you know, letters from, from the petitioner, but also letters from, you know, a bank or a tax authority or something confirming that the documents are no longer available or they never existed. And sometimes we have to be creative. You know, sometimes we have to show, uh, you know, photographs or, you know, other types of, of documentation to kind of complete the story. Um, you have to see what the investor has available and really stress that if they don't document as much as possible, they're going to be in for a tough ride. And it's always good to remember that the standard of proof here is a preponderance of the evidence, more likely than not. Um, it's, you know, we need to show that, um, you know, we have more likely than not that this evidence came from a lawful source. Um, but we really are seeing adjudications that are, are ve request very detailed documentation. They really want to see um, all of the, the I's dotted and the T's crossed. Now, I'll finish up with a few hot issues. Um, you know, we've seen in the last year or so a lot of talk about the EB-5 program. Um, 
those of you who have really followed the program know that the regional center part of the EB-5 was set to expire on September 30th of 2015. We had a short extension followed by a little longer extension. We now have an expiration date of September 30th of 2016. Um, in that time, we've seen a number of EB-5 bills being proposed in Congress, in the House and the Senate. Um, you know, we've had uh, kind of run the gamut between possible changes. One of the most common changes is the investment amount. You know, the, the investment amount has not changed since the program was created in 1990. So it's very, very uh, likely that the minimum investment amount will go up. The last time we've, you know, we've heard 800,000 for TEA investments, 1.2 million for non-TEA investments. Uh, we've heard gradual increases uh, for the consumer uh, price index. Um, you know, the one certainty is is that it, it probably will go up when it goes up. We don't know. Uh, you know, I think if you had asked us last year, we probably would have told you that it would have the investment amount would have gone up by now, and it hasn't. Um, but it's something to to think about that the investment amount will likely go up in the future, in the near future. Um, one of the things that the bills also focus on is uh, integrity provisions to curb some of the fraud and abuse that we've seen in the news in the program. Um, there will most almost certainly be more restrictive requirements for project operators and for uh, even for investors for how they prove their lawful source of funds. Um, so we, it's something to also to consider if you're thinking about this now, we may see more restrictive uh, regulations in the future. Um, right now, nothing is really being done with the presidential election hanging over our heads. Um, we may even see a short, clean extension of the current EB-5 regulations between now, between September 30th and the presidential election in November, uh, kind of to bridge that gap. We're hopeful that we do at least so we don't have a gap. Um, and then after the election, we may see uh, more sub substantive uh, rule changes coming. Uh, but we have to just stay tuned because there are a number of issues that still need to be ironed out. Um, so with that, um, that's kind of a, a very quick summary of some of the main options for green cards for investors and entrepreneurs. You know, if they qualify for any of these, um, you know, if they're coming as an investor, we can usually do them as an EB-5. Um, if they're already here in a managerial capacity, we can try to do them as an EB-1C. Or if there's somebody who is an established business person and is, has really been at the top of their field, you know, they may have an EB-1A application. So there's a few options for investors and entrepreneurs that you know, it's, it's good to kind of have this background to know that there are a few options available. And you know, if you would like to contact us, and my contact information is on the screen, I'd be more than happy to set up a consultation and discuss which options are available. And of course, to go into more detail on any of these options and what requirements there are in, in, in greater detail. So thank you again for, for attending. Thank you for, for listening to us. And we hope this has been helpful. And we hope that you'll listen to our, our upcoming webinars as well. And we hope you have a great day. Thanks.